Today, we're going to look at the very first time in Scripture that the word church is ever used. And it's spoken first by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16. We'll be in verses 13 through 20. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. If you don't, the words will be on the screen behind me. But let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now Jesus, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others uh, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. For I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, praise be to God. You may be seated. God, your word declares that all men are like grass, and all our glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but your word, O oh Lord, your word stands forever. Lord, may this be the word that is preached today. We recognize that unless you speak, nothing of any eternal significance will be spoken here today. So speak, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our passage starts off today with Jesus. It says, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi. Now in Matthew 16, we are in the last year of Jesus' life. In fact, it, it's just a few months before he will go to the cross. He's about to finish up his ministry in Galilee, the northern area, and he will start his march to Jerusalem where he will meet the cross. But before he starts that journey, he's going to take his disciples somewhere that they've never been before. Somewhere that if you're a parent, you would be looking at your kids going, don't go to Caesarea Philippi. You can go wherever, but don't go there. He's going to take them to the most worldly, pagan, idol-worshipping, sexually immoral, grotesque city in the area of that day. And he's going to take these young men right up there to Caesarea Philippi. But Caesarea Philippi is near the top of the map on this side. Now I'll show you that it's 200 kilometers north of Jerusalem, 40 kilometers north of Capernaum in the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus marches these young men outside Israel to a place that they've never been before. And this place, it's at the base of a huge mountain. I think we've got a picture of this huge mountain. It's Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is covered in snow. If you go to Jerusalem or go to Israel, you won't see any snow except on Mount Hermon. It's the one place you'll see snow. And when that snow melts, it flows down the mountain and it converges at this place where two rivers are formed, River Dan and the River Hermon, and it comes to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi has this huge rock that the water comes through, and they believed that the gods entered through that rock with the water. Because see, in the ancient world, 
Even like today, water is life. You don't have water, you're going to die. And, and most of the cities in the ancient world, they would set up very close to water because you had to have water to live. So they believe that this is the place where the gods, all their false pagan gods, came to reproduce and to bring life of more gods in. So it was a, a unique place called Caesarea Philippi. Now the name, Caesarea Philippi, it's named after Caesar Augustus, and it's named after Herod Philip. Herod Philip was the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great ruled when Jesus was born. He was the Herod, very cruel man. He had three sons that he left his empire with. One of them was named Herod Philip. Herod Philip, to show you how twisted the Herods are, he married his half-sister. But his half-sister left him to marry his half-brother, Herod Antipas. So can you imagine the family drama? That's not, they probably didn't have very good family get-togethers. But Herod Antipas and his wife Herodias had John the Baptist killed because John the Baptist said, you've taken your brother's wife. So he had him killed. And that's the city where Herod Philip ruled was uh, Caesarea Philippi. It was Greek, Hellenistic, Roman. They have found evidence, and there's a good picture of what the city looked like back in Jesus' day. This is an artist's rendition. You can see it's very Roman. They found evidence of worship of Zeus, evidence of worship of um, Caesar, of Baal, of Asherah, of every false god you can think of. They found evidence that there was people worshiping them there. But guess what they found no evidence of? A synagogue. No evidence that the Jewish people worshipped there. This was absent of any semblance of the one true God. It was full of pagan, full of idol worship, and that's where Jesus takes these young men. In fact, the chief God that they worshipped there was a God called Pan. Now, I googled Pan. I was going to show you a picture of Pan. But when I saw his picture, I thought, I'll spare you because he is a gross-looking God, false God. He's half goat. He's half man. And that's who they worshipped. In fact, we get an English word from pan. If you look up the roots of the word panic, just Google it. Google the word panic, and you'll see that its roots are from the false god pan. That's what this God brought was sheer panic to the people. And they would come to Caesarea Philippi to worship all of these false gods. So here in verse 13, Jesus marches his disciples to a place that no good Jewish boy or girl would go. Again, your parents would say, never. Don't ever go up to Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus goes, that's where I'm taking you. And they're probably going, what are we doing? And now Jesus' disciples, a little bit about them. If you ever see artist renditions of the disciples, often they appear gray beard, gray hair, and old. I don't think that's an accurate picture of the disciples. In fact, for someone to follow a rabbi, they were usually between 13 and 30. That's when you followed a rabbi. At age 30, you could either become a rabbi, you would begin to be an, a mature man. In Jewish culture, at age 13, you're a young man. Age 30, you're an older, wiser, mature man. But between 13 and 30, you would do a job with your father. What did Jesus do? Carpenter. He built things with his dad, Joseph. Remember James and John when Jesus walks by the Sea of Galilee and goes, hey, come follow me. And it says they left the boat that their father Zebedee was in. James and John were working with their dad, learning to be fishermen. So these disciples, most likely they were in their teen years and early 20s. Peter, Peter's the oldest of the disciples. Peter was married and in this culture, men got married between the age of 17 and their early 20s. So Peter is probably somewhere in his early 20s. 
The youngest disciple is John. And you wouldn't have followed a rabbi until you were 13. So this is three years into Jesus' ministry. So John could have been as young as 16. We can't say this emphatically, but what I want you to see is this is a group of young men, teenagers, men in their 20s, and Jesus is taking them somewhere to give them a final exam. Students, all of us who've been in school, remember when you would take a final the final was, over everything you've learned, we want to see if you comprehend what you've been learning, what we've been teaching you. And Jesus marches these young men up to a place of pagan worship to see if they understand. And he asks them this question, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Impersonal. Just tell me. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they start listing names. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. They give lots of different answers. But then Jesus, in verse 15, He asks the question. He makes this one personal. And this is the most important question that anyone will ever answer. This is the most important question that we'll see in the in totality of the Bible. Here it is. Jesus says, Who do you say that I am? Who do you? Each of you. Who do you say I am? In the Greek, this word you, it's in a form that goes you all. Each of you as an individual. These disciples before Jesus. Who do each of you say that I am? That's a question everybody's got to answer. To our young people, to our children and teenagers, that's a question you've got to answer. Mom and dad can't answer that for you. You've got to make a decision. Who do you say Jesus is? That's something that we each have to answer. Who do we say Jesus is? So this is the key question of all of Scripture that we get here. And in verse um, 16, Simon Peter. Peter's always the first to speak. And some people will give Peter sort of a negative impression. You know, they'll say he's always speaking before he thinks. Sometimes Peter says things that are just wrong. But here's the thing. Peter's the oldest. And some of you will get this very well. In this culture, it's more of a collective culture. I come from a highly individualistic culture. You ask a question, I'll tell you what I think. But when you're from a collective culture, you want to know what everybody else thinks before you answer. And also, many cultures respect age in such a way that you're going to allow and expect the older person, the senior person, to answer. That's who Peter is. When the question's asked, all the disciples look at Peter. What's Peter going to say? He's the oldest. So Peter feels always this pressure to answer. And I love that he's called Simon Peter here. Simon, that's the name. That's his earthly name. Peter's the name that Jesus gave him. Sometimes you'll hear him called Simon and he's acting like, more like the world. Sometimes he'll be called Peter and he's stepping into his God-given nature and acting more holy and righteous and more like Christ. And sometimes he's called Simon Peter because you don't know how he, what he's going to do. Here he's called Simon Peter. And he replies, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now this is a beautiful declaration. I don't think Peter said this in some monotone. I think he declared it and said, You're the Christ! Everything we've been waiting for, that's who you are! And you're not like these dead pagan gods. You're not Zeus. You're not Asherah. You're not Baal. They're all dead or either possessed by the demonic. They have no power. You're the son of the God who is alive. He's living, he's active, and he's powerful and mighty. I think Peter declared that with great boldness. Today I want to show you four things that we see in this passage about the church. There may be more. These are just four things I picked out. First thing I want us to see is what Peter just said. 
The church has a confident confession. That's our primary mission. We have a confession. Why do we exist? We exist to declare He's the Christ, Jesus. He's the Son of the living God, and we live to declare that to the world. We can be confident in it. We can stand in it. It's a confession that we can do boldly. And that's what Peter does here. He boldly speaks it. You see, as the church, we're not a group of people who get together just to hear a, someone speak or hear a motivational speech or hear a speech that will make you feel better about yourself. That's not what we do. As, as a church, we don't gather just to seek help from all of our struggles and difficulties and addictions. Sure, the church should, should be a part of that, but that's not our primary purpose. We don't gather just so that we feel sort of spiritual and feel good about ourselves. We don't gather to mindlessly sing songs, to mindlessly hear prayers, to mindlessly hear a sermon. That's not what we gather for. No, we gather because we love our Lord Jesus and we want to worship Him. We will be reminded of who we are. You see, the word church, it literally means this, assembly. In fact, it means called out assembly. It's a called out group of people who gather together to worship God. Now, at times I'll hear Christians say, especially where I'm from in the United States, I'll hear this a lot. You can be a Christian without being a part of the church. You can be okay with that. I don't think that's true. Now, I think you may be a Christian, but you can't live obediently walking in the fullness of who Christ has called us to be without the body of Christ. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, we are not a perfect church. Why? One reason, I'm here. I know I'm an imperfect person. And another reason, you're here and you're an imperfect person. But we come to worship a perfect Savior. And we come to boldly declare that He is the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. You see, the church is made up of those who are what Scripture calls born again. A new creation. A little Christ. That's what the word Christian means. Sometimes we refer to this as conversion. You see, you're not born a Christian. You become a Christian when you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, that He is the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. That's who He is. And He's died for my sins to reconcile me. That's glorious good news. You see, we are all marching toward death. All of us have this in common. We are on a path that leads to an eternal separation from God that leads to death. We're all going there. It's what we all have in common. We all have this in common. We're going to die. Doesn't matter how smart you are. Doesn't matter what nation you're from. Doesn't matter who your parents are. Doesn't matter any of that. Doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, any of those things. None of that matters. We're all going to face death unless Christ returns before that happens. But for the Christian, oh, there's no sting in death. For the Christian, oh, there's no fear in death. Death's lost its sting. We're victorious. We live forever. When this body fades and dies and no longer operates, I'll be with God in glory and one day I'll get a new body. Resurrected. We can wait and live for that day. See, to be a Christian, to convert is you're headed toward death in sin and you turn and go the other way toward Christ. Knowing that He's sufficient, He's enough. You run to Him. And it's not just a one-time thing. Oh sure, becoming a Christian is placing your faith in Him once and for all. His blood is sufficient for all the sin you'll ever commit. But for the Christian, when we gather and we see our sin, we run back to Christ. One of the marks of a church. And you're not a, it's not a, a gathering of people is not a church unless these two things exist, Okay. So you may have a small group, you may gather with some people, you may say, hey, we're a church, but if these two things exist, I'll tell you, biblically speaking, you're not a church. Baptism. The church, we say, hey, you're a part of the body of Christ. You give a 
credible testimony to who Jesus is. You show signs of conversion. We believe you're a new creation. You've declared Christ is alive. He's the son of the living God. And communion. We take communion once a month. And you know what it's time for you to do? You look and you go, I'm a sinner. I confess my sins and I run back to Jesus. Thank you that you've forgiven every sin I've done, every sin I will ever do. Your grace is completely sufficient. But God, I confess that sin still keeps me from living and experiencing you the way that you've intended me to. So God, I want to sin less than I did, knowing that I'll never be totally sinless. We want to have less sin in our lives. So the church, we baptize. We celebrate communion. So conversion, a person turns from their sin toward Christ. Can a person say, I believe in Jesus and not be converted? Sure. They can say it up here, but their life's not transformed, their life's not changed. No, a Christian confesses sin, turns from it, and trust. Your life is built on Christ, and you continually come back to Him. He's sufficient. He's, he's enough. In verse 17, Jesus answered, And blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. Second thing the church has. Church has a sovereign Savior. What I mean by that is God is all-powerful, and He's saying to, uh, Jesus is saying to Peter, you couldn't figure this out on your own. God revealed it to you. God's the one who opens the eyes of the blind. But guess what we do? We go and declare this message to all who will hear. And guess what we do? We step out in faith and in trust in Jesus. We step out in trust in Jesus by faith, but it's our sovereign Savior who reveals to us who He is. Now you and I have the great joy of going and declaring to everyone we can that we have a confident confession of who Jesus is and telling people about it. But the opening of the eyes God opens eyes and that person steps forward in faith and trust in Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. And that's what he's saying here. Simon, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My father, he's the one who's showed you this. In verse 18, he says, I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's a lot in verse 18. First off, we see the first mentioning of church in verse 18. As I mentioned, that means assembly, a set-apart assembly. You see, you can't be a part of the church if you're not gathering with the saints. We need one another. We need each other. Don't let the enemy feed you a lie that you're fine being a Christian without the church. You need the body of Christ. And here, it's the assembly that gathers and he says to Peter, you are Peter. The Greek word there is petros. And he says, and on this rock, the Greek word for rock is petra. Now, why do I mention that? I'm not very good at Greek, but here's what I can tell you. Peter's name means small pebble. The word rock that the church is going to be built on means huge, massive boulder. Now, let me show you what Caesarea Philippi looks like today. We've got a picture of it. Jesus gathers his disciples here in this city. And you've got this massive rock. And at the base of this rock, water flows out. And Jesus looks at them and goes, You're Peter. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And they're staring at this huge rock that is filled with false worship. What is Jesus saying here? What's the rock that he's going to build his church on? Well, I'll tell you this, it's not Peter. The word for Peter here is little pebble. The word he's using for rock, and the rock that the church is built on, is the confession that Jesus just made. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what the church is built upon. That you are the Christ, you're the Son of the living God. That's the foundation of the church. Without that, there is no church. When a church stops declaring it, 
They may have the name church on their building, but they're no longer a church. By definition, a church declares you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the role of the church. We're to declare that. And at the bottom of that big rock that you see, there's all sorts of little pebbles. And he looks at Peter and says, you're Peter. And all these little pebbles, they're going to be the ones that go and declare this message. They're going to be the ones who go and spread the good news. And he says here, he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know where they were standing? There's a place called the gates of hell. Right there in Caesarea Philippi. They believed, they built temples. So we, uh, one, of the, one of the pictures you saw a minute ago had temples right in front of the gate of hell. It had right in front of these uh, opening. And there at, at the gate of hell, they believed these demons came out. And there was water at that time. There was an earthquake in 1850s that crushed the rock and water doesn't come out there anymore. But up until then, water came out. And they would gather to be the first to greet the false gods as they entered, the, entered to our world. And they worshiped them through heinous acts, through grotesque, unmentionable acts there in front of that rock that they called the gate of hell. I've got a picture of Margaret now there, I think. You can see that picture. We're standing at what they call the gate of hell. For some reason, I'm smiling. Margaret has a more appropriate reaction. She looks quite concerned. But that's literally the place where they built these temples. And they would worship there. And Jesus looks at it and says, the gates of hell will not overcome the church. And that's the third thing we learn about the church. The church has a mighty mission. We have a mighty mission. It's strong. It's robust. It's worth giving your entire life to. Regardless of what you do vocationally, regardless of your neighborhood, regardless of your family, regardless of where you live, there's no greater joy than living on mission with Christ, than living in this mighty mission. And He gives us a mighty mission that will be victorious. The gates of hell will not overcome it. And these young men are standing at this terrifying place called the gates of hell. And he's saying, they're not going to overcome the church. The church will be victorious. Verse 18. He says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, the church, as I mentioned with baptism, the church is given a unique role God gives the church the role of coming to people and saying, you appear to have trusted Christ. We're going to baptize you. We're going to, based on your confession, say, hey, you have entered into the kingdom of heaven. The keys to the kingdom is the confession that you are the Christ. You get to enter. Now, we don't do that perfectly. Certainly, there's people who confess and are baptized and then turn away. But that's the role that he gives to the church. So here's the thing, the church has a powerful position. Don't miss this. There is power in the church. We have a power here. The Spirit works through the people of the church. And for the Christian to say, I don't need the church, flies in the face of Scripture. For the Christian to say, I don't need the church, you're not accessing the power of the body of Christ. We need to assemble. We need to be together. This idea of the church is that we assemble. We come together. And now I know that there are places on earth where there is no church. Where a church has to be more of a small group starting out of believers trying to figure these things out. I get that. Let me tell you, Sometimes people will call their small group of buddies the church. Me and my friends gather, this is church. I would challenge that and say, look at what Scripture says. Church, church, we baptize. 
Church, we take communion. A church, we have biblically qualified leaders. We have elders at our church. So they have biblical qualified leadership. And a church has a right view of Scripture and a right view of Christ. Anything else? You can put whatever you want on the door. You can put up a website and call it whatever you want. But biblically speaking, it's not a church. No, the church is the gathered saints. And here's what I love about the church. We gather. We're from many nations. I suspect there's some people in here that you have very little in common with other than Jesus Christ. Some people that you wouldn't probably talk to or spend much time with. And God calls us to gather to worship. And when you are not a part of a church, two people you're hurting. One, we need you. If you're a Christian who's not a part of the church, we need the body of Christ. You're denying the body of Christ yourself and what God has done in your life. And there's someone, there's some people here that need you. You're needed. And guess what else? You're denying yourself. You're denying yourself of the power that God has in and through the church. You're denying yourself of this. And I hope I don't come across wrong on this because I'm not looking to guilt anybody or shame anybody. But here's what there is. There is a great joy in being a part of a church. There's a great joy in serving and recognizing and going, it's not a perfect place. They don't do everything maybe the way I'd want to do it. But I'm going to serve and give and be a part of the church. I can think of the men and women in my life who when I was a young boy, I went to a church. My granddad took me. He actually paid me to go to church. I don't know if that's an evangelism tactic or not. But he would take me to Sunday school. And I would get dropped off each week, go to Sunday school. And I remember the Sunday school teachers, those men and women. I don't remember much of what they taught. But I remember they were kind. I remember they loved me. I remember they told me about Jesus. You see, a church, we're living and active. Don't buy the lie that you can really be obedient and live how Christ has called you to live apart from the body of Christ. We need you. You need one another. And here's what the enemy wants to do. This happens every Sunday morning nearly. We try hard to not make this happen. But every week, time to go to church, guess what happens to our boys? Start arguing, oh, we're getting up too early. Oh, we didn't want to go. We didn't sleep enough. All this complaining. Everything. The enemy wants to keep you from being here. The enemy wants to get you alone. If the enemy gets you alone, whew, isolation is trouble. Sin is going to creep in. And you buy the lie that you're strong enough to do it. I can do it. I'm, I'm, I'm tough enough. I'm strong enough. I can, I can walk the Christian life on my own. That is a lie. You need one another. You need people in your life. And they need you. So again, we're not a perfect church. But brother and sister, if you're call yourself a Christian here today, find a church, plug into a church. Being the pastor here at IEC, I tell you, I'd love for it to be IEC. But if this isn't the church for you, I would, I'm happy to sit with anyone here and help you process a church. I'm happy to tell you another church in our city, other churches that I say, hey, I know that pastor, godly man, proclaims the gospel. I'm happy to help you find a place, but find a church and plug in and be involved. That's what God calls us to. Small groups are great. We need them. That's part of being in the church. Leading small groups, being involved in that. But make no mistake about it, the church is the bride of Christ. All these other things, they're like the wedding attendants. Not bad, they're good things, but their job is to point to the bride. The bride at a wedding 
Maybe different different cultures, but the culture I come from, the bride is the one who everybody pays attention to. Is the bride, the body of Christ. And that bride's not perfect. The church isn't perfect. We're not a perfect church. But I would encourage you, plug in. And I don't want to... I, I don't want to be saying this just as the pastor who's trying to get more people involved. I say this. There is a joy in engaging in the church. At times it's hard. At times it's messy. You have imperfect people. But you need it. We need it. We need one another. That's how God has made it. That's why the assembly is so vital and so important. Last thing Jesus says in verse 20 of our passage today, then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was a Christ, the Christ. That's simply because it wasn't time. But do you know what now is? Now is the time. We're to go tell all that we can tell. He is the Christ. We all get that joy. At times it's scary. At times you don't know how it's going to work out, but that's what we're called to, to go tell others, He's the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. And you may go do that at your place of work or in your neighborhood and people laugh at you or something, and you need to come back here and look around and go, the people in this room gathered to worship, they believe He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. I need to be encouraged in that and built up. We need to be reminded of that of those things. So church, we need to be the church. We need one another. And what I love about our church is we go out and serve out in this pagan world when we leave. That's great. But when we gather, we need to love each other well. We need to encourage and build up one another. This is how Jesus has designed it. The church is His chosen way of reaching the world. And the church isn't just a building. It's not a building at all. We call this the church building. It's the people. All who have received Christ their Savior are part of the church. The universal church and then the local church. And that's what we are. So church, whenever we end right out here, we have our ministry fair. Walk through it prayerfully. Saying, guys, there's something you want to put on my heart? Is there somewhere you could use me? God, I want to say, here I am. I'll help the church. I'll be a part of it. Sure, during the week I may be doing other things, but I want to be faithful. We need you. Let's pray. God, I thank you that we have a glorious confession. We can be confident in the confession that Jesus is the Christ. There is no other. I thank you that we have an all-powerful Savior who, Lord, we can't save ourselves. We can't be good enough. Christ is sufficient. Lord, you've given us a mighty mission. And what a joyful mission it is. It's not always easy, but we have a mighty mission to go out like Caesarea Philippi into these places that are difficult and hard where the gospel's never been heard. And we get to go there and declare, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we thank you for that. And Lord, you've given us power for what you've called us to. Lord, I suspect there are some here today that call AC home, but maybe they're not as involved in experiencing the joy of that. I pray that they don't feel shamed and guilted into serving. I pray that they taste the joy and a desire to go, I want to give my life to help build and strengthen the body of Christ so that the next generation of missionaries are raised up, so the next generation of pastors are raised up, so the next generation of business people that are going to share the gospel in the business world are lifted, are built up. Lord, use us as you see fit. Lord, if there's anything that's been said here today that was out of a wrong motivation or misunderstood, let it fall on deaf ears. But the things that come from your spirit, may they impact us deeply. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.